Hello, everyone, and welcome to Just a Physician, the podcast where we explore mental health, vulnerability, and personal life journeys with creators you know and love. And today's guest, I'm not sure if you guys have followed along the selfless journey, you will already have known who this is, but I'm so excited to have this guest on because he is making huge changes in the world and is the founder of a nonprofit that I hold very close to my heart and to my brand, Selfless by Hiram. Everyone, please welcome Seth Maxwell. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Of course, yeah. I'd love for like you, because we we go way back. Oh my gosh, our conversations started like years ago and it's been so cool to be able to like have, uh, you know, this journey together. I'm either going to be seeing you in like, what, two weeks, one week, next week? Like, Nine days. Yeah. Nine days. I'm so excited. I'm going to be at uh, the Thirst Project Gala. Um, We're doing an event that's focused on raising awareness about the global water crisis. But for anyone who's not familiar with Thirst Project or not familiar with you, like, please introduce yourself and what you do. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, My name is Seth Maxwell. I'm 34. I live in Los Angeles. And actually right now I lead two different organizations concurrently. Uh, One that you may be more familiar with called Thirst Project, which is focused on trying to end the global water crisis. Uh, Another newer one called Legacy Youth Leadership, which is focused on helping high school and college students uh, take action around the causes they care about the most. So uh, yeah, it's it's been a crazy like fourteen year journey, but that's what I do. Man, yeah, it has been fourteen years that you've been in. That's incredible. I mean, you have such a cool story of like how you first got involved with Thirst Project, and like I I'm been so privileged enough with Selfless to be able to partner with you guys in order to you know help alleviate um, the global water crisis and provide people with more access to clean drinking water. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, you guys can go to selflessbyhiram.com. We have a whole section of the website dedicated um, to talking about the impact that we've been able to have through our partnership with Thirst Project. But I can't believe it's been 14 years that you've spent it, it, you know, developing all of this, it's, it's incredible. I personally get a lot of inspiration from your story, but I'd love like, if you could share your story of like how you first got into this, like what first sparked this passion and this interest in the global water crisis. And even if you could just like, in short, break down like what the global water crisis is for anyone who doesn't know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's funny to say out loud, like 14 years, I'm like, oh man, I have been younger. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> you've been such an incredible partner. Like we've loved Thank getting you. to partner with Selfless and the impact you guys have made is like honestly, truly remarkable. But um, yeah, my, my story began or this work kind of began when I was 19. So I first learned about the water crisis from a friend of mine who was a photojournalist who uh, was working in the international development space. And at that point in my life, I was living in Los Angeles, uh, you know, 19, pretty focused on myself, uh, mm-hmm. kind of the opposite of selfless. And mm-hmm. uh, my whole worldview was just kind of shattered because I honestly had no idea that there were at that point in time over a billion people or 1.1 billion people then who just didn't have access to basic, safe, clean drinking water. Um, and through this friendship, I got to learn about her work and what that actually looked like and meant. And, uh, you know, in a really practical way today, what the water crisis looks like is there are still about 700 million people in the world who don't have clean water. And it's not just a big number. What it, you know, really practically means is that in communities all over the world, typically women or children will walk from their homes to whatever standing water sources are available. So it's most commonly rivers, ponds, swamps, but open, unprotected sources that are often shared with animals who will drink and defecate in the same water sources that people drink from. And so then as a result, people contract really easily preventable waterborne diseases, uh, things like diarrhea or dysentery. Similarly, because of the distances people have to walk to get water, it often means that women are unable to get jobs because it takes sometimes six, seven hours a day just doing the task of collecting water, or that children are unable to go to school or get an education because of the thousands of hours wasted each year just walking to get water. Mm -hmm. Um, So the water crisis, you know, touches all those aspects of life. But, you know, more kids under the age of five die from waterborne diseases than HIV and malaria combined. Um, And so I learned about that, you know, as a 19 year old, and I think kind of understandably, it felt overwhelming, almost, you know, immobilizing. Um, But one of the beautiful things that I love about young people is I think 
and we don't know when we're young, like what we don't know. And so mm-hmm. I just started talking to my friends saying like, hey, we have to you know, do something about this. And we started just having conversations with anybody who would listen saying, did you know, like, did you know this is happening? Um, trying to raise awareness around town in Los Angeles and uh, a few friends at a few other schools invited us to come and, and share and speak about what we knew there. And those first few schools started doing fundraisers and uh, everything kind of snowballed from there. It's so cool. Like from such a young age that you were able to kind of like really develop a passion and understand like the problem that is going on because so many people don't realize that uh, the global water crisis even exists, you know, in, in, in the first place. Like I remember doing, you know, research, um, in the process of building selfless because I was like, I really want to partner with a nonprofit organization that is making, you know, the biggest impact possible. And initially we started, you know, with like so many different like social, um, environmental and political issues. Um, but it was kind of shocking in the process of like, learning about thirst project um you know realizing how many people just still to this day don't have access to clean drinking water and not only that what you touched on how something as simple as not having access to clean drinking water can affect literally everything in a community everything about the quality of life about health about you know um women's rights and access to opportunities the amount of time um you know the dangerous uh, territories that people have to traverse in order to get water like education there's it funnels into so many different you know um social elements of of the way you know people are able to survive and solely by providing people with access to clean drinking water it can change so much which is one of the things i love about what thirst project does like if you could break down like what solution thirst projects aims to provide um that would that would be awesome yeah so i mean simply put from a missional perspective you know the goal of the organization is to see the end of the water crisis <laughs> uh to see that every single person has access to basic, safe, clean water, sanitation, and hygiene. Um, And that may sound, you know, impossible and sort of like idealistic, but, you know, in 14 years, we've seen the number of people without safe water go from over a billion to about 700 million. So essentially cut, you know, by a third. And uh, we believe we will see the end of the water crisis, not just in our lifetimes, hopefully in the next maybe 15, 20 years. Uh, And so it's super encouraging to see that process, but or that progress rather. But, you know, in terms of practically how do we deliver solutions, the way we build water projects in communities is we work with, first of all, local team members who are full-time staff of Thirst Project, uh, who oversee and lead all of our operations on the ground in any of the countries that we work with, which, you know, we're, we're currently active in four countries. Mm-hmm. And so in each of those countries, there are Thirst Project staff who are really the first point of contact that anybody in a community who interacts with the Thirst Project meets, um, you know, and so it's someone who, you know, looks like you, talks like you, has lived in the same country and says, hey, here's who we are, here's what mm-hmm. we, we do, do you want this? Um, if so, then there's a process that, you know, sort of uh, unfolds to make that happen. But we typically build either freshwater wells, might be hand pump borehole wells or uh, solar powered wells or sometimes, you know, bigger like reticulated systems uh, to deliver safe, clean drinking water. Sometimes we may do, you know, install bio sand filters to filter surface water into families' homes, but usually some kind of source like that. Then we will pair those with sanitation facilities, so pit latrines typically, and then uh, hand washing stations and training for hygiene. Uh, So all in all, it's called a wash program, so water Mm -hmm. and sanitation and hygiene. Um, But that's really not that unique. There are lots of great water organizations in the world working to address this, which is honestly great. Like Mm -hmm. no one agency could could possibly address the global water crisis, Mm -hmm. Uh, but what is unique is, you know, we have pretty stringent practices around sustainability and impact, uh, but then probably the biggest DNA differentiator for us in this space is, while we're certainly not the oldest or even necessarily biggest, we're absolutely the largest youth water organization. So, you Mm -hmm. know, there are, in any given year, hundreds of thousands of young people at, you know, hundreds of schools all across not just the country but the world who raise awareness of this issue with us, either at Thirst Project chapters or clubs or just schools who do dances, walks, video game tournaments to raise awareness and money to build these projects. 
uh, and we commit to give 100% of all their money directly to building water projects. So we have a pretty incredible group of donors and sponsors who you know fund all of our operating expenses. But um, mm-hmm. that's you know how we go about delivering those solutions, um, and it's a pretty like lengthy process uh, mm-hmm. as to like how, what that actually looks like when you like build a project, but. Uh, we can talk about them more if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Thank you for breaking that down because, like, obviously, I was uh, really attracted to, you know, Thirst Project and the work that you do um, because of just like the comprehensive approach to, um, you know, empowering communities with that solution. And I, I've, I've personally worked for nonprofits. So, like, that's how my mind works. And I love to, like, get into the details and all that kind of stuff. And if you guys want to learn, you know, more about the impact that Thirst Project has and the the solutions that you provide, you can go to thirstproject.org and, and learn about it there. But I think one of the things that really intrigued me is is what you touched on, the fact that, you know, it's youth led, it's youth driven. I resonate with that so much because I just think that like youth have so much power and untapped potential and just so much pent up energy that can be used to address social issues in a way that older generations just have either not done in the past or aren't able to do now. Like, and anyone who's, you know, like watching, if you, you know, you go on TikTok um, on any given day and you'll just see like teenagers, like 12 year olds, 13 year olds talking about like social issues and what we can do and how we can, you know, like um, make a positive difference in the world. You'll see so many young people at like protests and different things like that. And it's so incredible and encouraging to see and why I personally believe that Gen Z specifically just completely blows previous generations out of the water in terms of the global social awareness, but also just the energy that they have to like give to causes like this. And, you know, in the nonprofit space, like, and I'm sure you have definitely experienced this, particularly when you were 19 years old and first starting this, there sometimes tends to be a little bit of like a social hierarchy, uh, a little bit of like a, you know, uppity uh, type attitude when it comes to like younger people and wanting to make a change. Sometimes, you know, organizations stuff like that tend to be a little bit like corporate and political and very like, oh, well, what can you guys do? You're only X years old. You've, you don't have this experience or whatever. Instead, you guys are like, no, we're going to specifically work with youth to make as big of an impact as possible. Like what, what helps you kind of like come to that decision to want to utilize youth to make this difference? Um, so it, it was honestly less of a like formal decision making process where we mm-hmm. one day decided like, oh yeah, we're going to deliberately, uh, you know, orient ourselves around young people. Although today it's absolutely a conscious decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the beginning, two, two things were really true. Number one was I was young, uh, mm-hmm. right? Like I was 19. And so I think it's, it just makes sense. You operate within and work with the people you know. And so I think that was very much kind of like a, a driver in that for me. And um, two things are true. Uh, number one is that when we started, I was young, right? Like I was 19. And I think just naturally, we all kind of work within and operate within the peer groups and circles that we know. And so I reached out to the people I knew, my friends who were either students themselves or some of which were teachers at schools. And so I think that was just very much a natural thing that was almost less of a decision and just more of a me reaching out to the people I had access to. Mm-hmm. Um, but the second thing that I love about young people and speaking about what you're talking about is that, you know, I think, again, earlier I said, we don't often know what we don't know, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we haven't sort of, we're in many ways untainted, uh, untested, um, and that energy that comes with it is really powerful and beautiful. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, you know, I was talking to a group of students yesterday at a school. And this particular group, like they want to be entrepreneurs. And I was like, you know, like there are so many things that I know are ideas in your head, whether it's for how to build a company or how to launch a product or whatever that is, that is different than the way things are done right now. You look at things and see, man, there's, there is a different way, a better way. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think so often we like accept as you get older, we kind of like accept the world the way it is as if like, that's Mm -hmm. just how things have to be. Right. This is how you do charity. This is how mm-hmm. you do whatever skincare, right? Communication. And, you know, frankly, in the world we live in today, especially after the last almost three years, mm-hmm. uh, there is not a single leader alive today at any level of government, corporate life, social good, who has 
ever led out of a three-year world-altering global crisis, and not just one crisis, crisis into crisis into crisis, yeah. that have changed the way every industry works, every community operates. And so, frankly, we have a lot of experts in a world that doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I think the beautiful thing, of, like the beautiful thing about that for young people, like whether you are Gen Z or the emerging Gen Alpha, is like, yes, it is can be scary that it is uncharted, but it also is really exciting. Like you get to decide, no, this is how we're going to rebuild this thing ideally in a way that works for everybody with, Mm -hmm. you know, nothing and no one left out. And, you know, I think also looking at, to sort of speak about my generation of like millennials into Gen Z, into the emerging kind of upcoming Gen Alpha, like what's so fascinating about that particular subset of people in particularly American history is that it was really the first generation where there was this idea placed on the expectation that like every single person would go to some kind of higher education, whether that was mm-hmm. college, university, tra- trade school, that had never before been the expectation. So mm-hmm. you have this like very highly educated, but also highly like income insecure and mm-hmm. not underemployed, but certainly undercompensated. I mean, the, one of the highest wage gaps of any generation in the last 50, yeah. 60 years. So this highly educated, highly income insecure. Also, this is like not revolutionary thought, but like the most globally connected generation the world's ever seen. It's a group of people who grew up having conversations with people in other countries, learning about experiences they otherwise 20 years ago would have only ever heard about if they read about it in a book or watched Mm -hmm. it on TV. So you have this highly educated, highly income insecure, highly globally connected generation where 20 years ago, Sesame Street shifted all of their educational content from just emphasizing things like ABCs and 123s to really emphasizing concepts like sharing and caring, mm-hmm. empathy. And I, I say all this because sometimes people are like, oh, like, why is it that, you know, each generation sort of gets progressively more progressive? Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's fascinating <laughs> is I'm like, we have hardwired this generation with all of these things combined to not only be aware of, but I would say have the capacity or skill sets to tackle issues in a way that really no generation before ever was. Mm -hmm. And I I say that to say, I hope it's encouraging because I know that it's easy to, you know, spend two minutes scrolling on Instagram and just be overwhelmed Mm -hmm. by the very real need, right, in your own local community, global community. And I mean, I found myself, my friends in the last three, four years being like, man, like so many times asking the question, how, like how, how are we still here with any number of issues, right? How has mm-hmm. this in 2022 not been solved? Yeah. And if I can like encourage you, I-, I would assert the reason we're living through so many of the moments that we're living through and so many of the issues that have still yet to be solved is because there was never before really a generation that was truly equipped to solve them. And the reason mm-hmm. we're living through these moments is because these moments are our moments. These moments are your moment if we will just step into them and meet them. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. You touched on so many good points that I think are really valuable uh, because absolutely like the access to education, like not just formalized education, but like global cultural expectation via, you know, social media is so valuable. And when people post that question of like, how are we still, you know, like having this issue? Why haven't we resolved it yet? All these things. Well, I, you know, participate in and, you know, completely understand the frustration around just like, oh, these issues need to be resolved. The fact that, there is just the awareness piece alone, let alone the encouragement to take action on these issues and commitment, you know, wh- whether it be from individuals or from companies or governments to take action on those issues is so far ahead of where we've previously been, where even just mass awareness of, you know, whether it be the global water crisis, whether it be like homophobia, whether it be political injustices, like whatever it may be, um, just that level of awareness wasn't even present and that's why like you know I know a lot of people like will criticize and dog on um you know like younger people um and particularly Gen Z you know in a lot of ways but I I and this is coming from someone who's I guess technically I'm a part of Gen Z I don't know I'm a millennial whatever that means like I'm part millennial part Gen Z so I feel like I've been able to participate in like both generations but being able to see just the uh, like 
how educated the younger generations are increasingly becoming, how aware of, of things they are in comparison to the past and just how actionable that they are, I think is so positively encouraging. And yes, of course, there's side effects and there's negative aspects and, you know, there, there always will be. But just to see the amount of progress that has already been made just within the past few years because of younger people's awareness is so inspiring. And you said, like, younger people don't, don't know what they don't know. And I completely agree with that because I remember, you know, when, when I was young and, you know, talking with my family or people in my community, I came from a very small, very close minded community about things like, you know, humanitarian issues and these social issues. And I would just get so angry and just like, why are we not doing something about this? We need to change this. We need to adjust this. And, you know, my parents and people in my life would tell me like, Hiram, that's, you know, like just how it is. It's the way it is. And from a young age, I was always like, no, that is not okay. We have to change it. And, you know, it's because I hadn't been kind of uh, hardened to these things uh, that, which is a natural process, I think, of getting older. You just become more set in your ways and society's ways. And the benefit of young people who don't know what they don't know is that they're able to say, this is unacceptable. We have to change this. Who cares what you say? Who cares how it's been done in the past? We need to make a change. And that's why I think young people specifically are the biggest warriors of global change because they're the only people really willing to say like fuck the system fuck what's been done before we're gonna make a completely you know new system and completely new change and and i think thirst project is doing that i mean i i love young people right like that is the reason thirst project is a youth organization is for all the things you just said uh the idea that you know they're going to be and it's, it's interesting dance right i know so often as a young person the, the tension between seeing something and thinking, man, there is a different way. I, I have an idea for a better way, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we have a different idea mm-hmm. because we're wrong and we need to just like listen to people who've been around the block a few times. Mm-hmm. Sometimes Absolutely. we have an idea that is different because there is a better way. And the way things have always been done before is a really bad reason to keep doing that that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I can't tell you, I can't like tell you how to know which one is which, but I think I would always rather air on the side of speaking up and being wrong versus not speaking up and regretting it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's important to like question everything. Like I, and that's what I believe like younger people do so well. I, you know, remember uh, growing up, I was in an environment that was always just like, don't question anything, just take it for, you know, like face value, never, but you know, pose a challenge to anything. Kind of like what I was saying before that whole statement of like, it just is how it is. And I think what you said, like, there is importance in like listening to people who have had life lessons and who have valuable advice and life experience to be able to learn the mistakes not to do. But I think for so many issues, a lot of which people are, you know, like talking about on TikTok, like say if it's, you know, like the Black Lives Matter movement or, you know, like um, uh, police reform or uh, uh, homophobia and uh, transphobia, whatever it may be, all these issues, um, so much of the arguments I think in the, the the past has just been like don't challenge anything that's just is, is how it is like uh, that's just the way it's always been blah 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 and I think throughout all of time younger people have always been kind of the the you know first and foremost to really revolt against predatory systems but wow it seems like super just like at a hundred times the speed of over even just the course of like the past five, 10 years that I've seen it. And, and I think it's so cool that you're really utilizing that um, through Thirst Project. I really want to pick your brain as well about like a concept that I've seen, well, something that I've seen online. Um, and, and I think you could provide as a founder of a nonprofit organization, really valuable insight on, you know, we've been talking about the power of youth, the power of social media, how it can be such a positive, you know, vehicle of change. Um, Um, But, you know, when it comes to the online space as well, um, it's, you know, it it could be very critical. It could be very, you know, uh, people are understandably want to dissect, you know, why things the way that they are. And when it comes to like nonprofit organizations and and people who are making change and stuff, they want to dissect and really understand what they're doing, why they're doing all of that, which I think is really healthy. I think also in the online space, 
I have seen this interesting dynamic where a lot of times the people who or the organizations or whoever it may be who are trying to, you know, like instill the most change tend to be the recipient of a lot of criticism, a lot of backlash, a lot of uh, hypervigilance and kind of like criticizing the the solutions that they're providing. And I know that's a little bit vague, but like to give, you know, specific examples, like the creators I follow who are, you know, humanitarians who are talking about social issues, um, you know, nonprofit founders, um, different things like that. I tend to see get a lot of backlash online for the things that they're trying to make the world, uh, trying to do to make the world a better place. And you have experience, you know, like, uh, it's not only starting, but managing a nonprofit in the age of social media. And uh, like, I'm just curious, have you seen this occur? What has your relationship been like with the impact that you're making on social media? Um, how have you tried to navigate all of this? Um, well, there's, there's a lot that we could have like two yeah. whole podcast sessions just about that conversation, <laughs> but to kind of give some, I guess, like key points. Um, the first thing I'll say is, yeah, it's absolutely true. I think, you know, it's, uh, this is not like a new idea. It's always easier to sort of sit on the sidelines and like, you mm -hmm. know, throw stones uh, or, you know, sit in the cheap sheets, cheap seats and like throw fruit uh, than it is to like try to get your hands dirty and make an impact. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's often never the people who are doing more than you who are the most critical. It's typically the people who are, you know, not really doing much at all. Um, yes. However, what I will say on the, you know, as a, as a, as a note of encouragement to that, I would say at the end of the day, as long as the work that you're trying to do is, you know, absolutely centered from a place of really the best interest of either the populations that you want to serve, the environment you're trying to impact, whatever that is, uh, rather than a, a place of, hey, this is, you know, where I get my identity from or, you know, mm -hmm. my own self-fulfillment or whatever. You know, at the end of the day, I, I, we, we, and not just we, Thirst Project, I personally have gotten so much wrong over the last 14 years, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you don't, you, you don't build anything without making, you know, many mistakes along the way. Yes. And I think the, the biggest difference, you know, between maybe experiencing some of the sometimes very warranted, like negative feedback or critical feedback, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes not so much warranted, right? Is, you know, at the end of the day, I try to receive that and go like, hey, you know what, like, I receive that. Like I, I can always do better. I, I always want to do better. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, people who are just out to be like negative or mean, uh, are right. But it does mean that like, I always, I want to make sure that I'm always operating from a place of like being receptive and open to that con like that criticism or feedback. Because at the end of the day, like the last thing I want to do is end up having good intentions and causing more harm than I intended yes. to. Right. Um, and so I think, yeah, we, we can sort of sit around and dissect like different examples or experiences where someone uh, may have tried to do good and gotten torn down for it. Um, and that's really sad, right? And I think at the end of the day, though, that person, I hope, whoever she or he may be, is able to go to bed at night. And if they made really positive impact and if the people they served know, like, yeah, you, you made positive impact here, uh, you know, you, you didn't cause harm. Or if you did cause harm, hopefully it was minimal and, and certainly unintentional and they're able to grow from it. I think that's the, we have to come back to those spaces, like come back mm -hmm. to what do I know to be true? What do I know to be true about me and my intention and my heart? What do I know to be true about the impact that I've made? Because obviously, you know, intention can't always trump impact if my intentions mm -hmm. are great, but my impact's really bad. That's not great. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the inverse is not true either. And so I think being able to say, hey, I, I made the most positive impact I could uh, with the best intention. Uh, and if I made negative impact, I was willing to learn about it, grow and change to do better. Um, yeah. But I think, yeah, that's, you know, that's without, I know that was very vague, right? But uh, without diving good. too deep into it, like I would say, I, I think I, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, do you know Ziad Ahmed? Oh, that sounds so familiar. Refresh me on who. Ooh, that is. He's a he's just a he's a friend of mine. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Oh, okay. He's a brilliant uh, creator and uh, okay. activist who's been like you know uh, the front of a lot of different movements the last like you know decade or so. But he's this incredible like twenty three year old Muslim like recent Yale grad who is wow. uh, leading a, a lot of like brand big brands to. Uh, sort of invite Gen Z to have a seat at the table rather than like, hey, how do we market to and sell to them? Like maybe ask them and like bring them around the table. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so it's, it's, he's anyway, he he talks a lot about, like I recently listened to a talk he gave where he was like, you know, 
this is these are his words, not mine. He's like, I, I bought the lie a decade ago that social media will empirically every time make the world better. And in so many ways it has, right? Like you, th there's no question, like we wouldn't have been able to raise money with so many different campaigns that we raised that were exclusively online with tools that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. Or, you know, you look at other movements, like there's no way the Arab Spring would possibly have happened mm -hmm. without Twitter. Like literally whole like tyrannical government regimes toppled because yeah. people were able to, to organize and communicate in a way that was never before possible. Um, what's interesting is in the last like three, four years, four or five years, you know, not just interpersonal negativity with people who are mean or trolls or, uh, you know, the, the negative mental health impacts on people individually, but also mm -hmm. I think, you know, the way that, you know, misinformation or galvanization of communities that are looking to do harm uh, has really risen in a way that's, I think, understandably discouraging and, and worrisome for the future. And so I don't know that I would say empirically, I, I believe that social media every time uh, is is always advancing humanity forward or progressing us forward, but it has done some undeniable good. And I think as we move forward, I know like, you know, uh, there's a lot of really interesting conversations that like, uh, I think it's like Ashton Kutcher talks a lot about like, man, their kids, that mm -hmm. the, the conversations that they have with their kids about what these tools are, what is real, how to engage with it in a way that is, uh, you know, not only real and, and has a self-awareness of who that person is, but uh, what's healthy. And I think that we're all just living in a completely new world. Like 10 years ago, these mm -hmm. things didn't exist. These things that we, these things that we just feel like have always been a part of human life. And so I think mm -hmm. we don't yet really fully understand how to navigate, you know, generation to generation, the best use cases for that moving forward. And that's something I think as we explore this uncharted world, we're all going to have to figure out how to build together. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, I would say, be nice and, uh, you know, t take heart, you know, uh, be open enough and humble enough to receive negative feedback, but also like, uh, you know, don't be mean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you touched on a point that I, I, we actually just had um, a podcast episode with Alison Teal, who she's a, an incredible woman who actually lives in Hawaii, who has done so much to raise awareness about uh, plastic um, uh, waste in the ocean. And she helped to ban plastic bags in California. Um, incredible. And we were talking about how social media is a tool. It is a tool that can be used for good and for bad and that we need to see it as such and treat it as such because it, it has the power to do so many incredible things while simultaneously completely destroying people and completely destroying, you know, like even, even societies like what you were talking about. And I love that you said that. And it, the self-awareness that I think you present as someone who is the founder of a nonprofit organization is really, really good um, because uh, I think a lot of the hypervigilance online when it comes to like people doing good and organizations doing good is because of how many times in the past we have been burned by organizations or people who are presenting maybe good intent, but the end results uh, ends up hurting or harming communities more so um, than had they not done, you know, anything at all. And uh, a lot of times I think, you know, in uh, nonprofits that I've seen, um, been affiliated with, um, there's not always that self-awareness present where it's like, how can I make sure that not only my intent and my heart is in the right place, but that the end impact is actually yielding a positive result. I think we've talked about a little bit about this before, but one book that I love, um, that I highly recommend to any of you, if you ever consider, you know, volunteering for a nonprofit organization or working for a nonprofit or getting into social issue work is called Toxic Charity. Um, and it's this, um, it's written by an author author who he spent a lot of time working for nonprofit organizations and was able to see the ways in which charities can inflict a lot of damage all under the name of good intent. Um, and it was really mind blowing to me because I realized like, whoa, we need to really reanalyze the way that we are doing social good. And I think one of the benefits of social media is that, you know, people have an increased awareness of the negative side effects of, you know, uh, charities operating. But in my conversations with you, um, you've, you've always had that self-awareness for yourself and for your organization of like, we need to be just as focused on, you know, where our hearts are 
as we are every step of the you know solutions we're helping to provide and it's funny like I remember one of our first conversations that we had I was basically grilling you um, which I apologize for I was basically grilling you on like thirst project I was like tell me the details I need to know how this works that it's not you know negatively impacting people that it's not harming communities that it's not hurting anyone blah 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 and I just kind of went through a bunch of questions and you were so awesome in like responding to all of them and I was able to firsthand see like wow this person is really paying attention to all the details of how to make sure that everything that you do yields a positive result. And so thank you for like not only adopting that mindset, but applying it into your organization as well, because I think, you know, as people become increasingly aware of the good and the bad that charities can do, um, it's cool that you are aware of that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I, I am uh, not under the misconception like that we we or I have like not made tons and tons of mistakes and we, of we get it wrong yeah. a lot, right? The the hope is to do that less and less and you know obviously make as as little harm and as much good as possible. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's great. I mean, thank you. I also want to ask like another question. This is something I actually just barely learned in doing research for this podcast episode but you've you work as a member of the u.s department of state's u.s speaker program for international programs that's super cool tell me about it like what what do you do for that and and how has it impacted the work that you do in alleviating the global water crisis yeah it's uh it's funny there are like a handful of stories from the last 14 years one of which is actually you where like you know 90% 90% of the time when we build a relationship with uh, you know, a brand who becomes a partner or an influencer or a creator who uses their platform uh, to mm-hmm. you know, amplify our message or, or someone who gives a lot of money, uh, nine times out of 10, we're like seeking it out. Like we're like hunting those relationships. And then there's a few times where like we get an email and I'm like, this is real, like it's a spam. Uh, <laughs> or they, you guys like reached out to, uh, I was mm-hmm. like, uh, I don't know about this. Uh, but that was one where like I got an I got an email from a representative from the U.S. State Department that was like, hey, you know, we we'd like would you be interested in joining this program, our speaker bureau, uh, where essentially the work and the, the objective of the program is to represent the United States, uh, but also your specific, you know, area of expertise or interest um, in different communities around the world and, and go and speak. So sometimes that might look like uh, like quite literally, you know, one of the things I was asked to do was go to Ireland and basically keynote and lead this youth hackathon, uh, which I was like, wow, nothing about like hackathon. <laughs> like I like had to do like all this research uh, mm-hmm. beforehand. Right. And a, a part of what they wanted me to speak about was, yes, the water crisis, but m- more so like, hey, here is what we are doing to galvanize and support and activate young people as they try to make change in the world. Uh, and then here's what you can do with this, you know, event, right? Uh, sometimes it looked like quite literally, you know, going into one of the largest townships, uh, you know, sort of a, if you're familiar with the concept, like a, a slum essentially in mm. Cape Town and speaking mm. at an entrepreneurship program in that particular community, uh, which, you know, was regarded as like really very dangerous. But the, the people mm. who were there were incredible. And the young people who I got to meet with and have conversations with who were, you know, I mean, incredibly smart, some like exponentially better ideas than I have about how they were going to elevate themselves and their families and their community out of poverty and try to bring equity and justice was like super humbling and encouraging. And so uh, in each of those cases, I, you know, I've had to uh, go, you know, represent and speak not just about like, oh, here's what America is doing, but hey, like, mm-hmm. tell me who you are. What are you up to? Here's what I know. And it's kind of this like exchange of, uh, you know, hopefully helpful information. Wow, that is super cool. Like what a what a like a, a random opportunity that was kind of like presented to you and that's like to represent like US Department of State like that's really intense. That's super cool though. And I that's awesome that you're able to make like a uh, even more extensive difference, you know, outside of what you're doing with, you know, your own individual organizations and being able to to do that as well and like travel around. Like that that's a really cool opportunity. I was genuinely curious because I was like what? How have I never known this about about you? And I've like known you for years. Um, so so that's really cool. I mean, in line with that, uh, you know, obviously 
you as a person are so passionate about helping people. Um, and aside from, you know, the, the water crisis, like what are some other issues that you, you know, are really passionate about or like uh, currently contributing to, or, you know, th that you find a lot of interest in educating people about beyond the water crisis? Yeah. You know, I, I, Obviously, Thirst Project is is hyper focused on ending the water crisis. That hasn't changed since mm -hmm. I, I launched Legacy. But uh, I did start another organization about four years ago. Uh, the idea of which was born out of you know we were working with all of these students every year, a couple hundred thousand, coaching them to raise money to build these water projects, and in doing so. We were teaching students how to be better communicators and public speakers. And yes, you know, the skill of raising money, which is valuable across, you know, so many other applications. But also there was this incredible, like, organization and strategic planning component and social emotional development that was happening. And we kind of realized, you know, like so many of the young people who probably could benefit from that the most, uh, those skills were probably students in communities that we were working with the least, right? Lower income mm -hmm. communities, uh, mm -hmm. often communities of color. And so uh, also all those skills were being developed completely by accident. Like that wasn't the purpose of Thirst Project's work. And so we started dreaming about what it would look like to develop programs to help young people develop these skills and then hopefully apply them uh, around whatever cause or issue they cared about. Um, because, you know, while I do believe from a health and human services perspective or a humanitarian perspective, the water crisis is the most pressing issue we face uh, because it is interconnected with everything from health, hunger and food security, education. But like I said at the beginning, I also believe we'll see the end of that issue uh, mm -hmm. in maybe 15, 20 years. Um, yes. And so I, I also care really deeply about climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I know a little bit, but I'm never going to start an organization to address or try to combat climate change. There are mm -hmm. subject matter experts who've been working in that space for generation. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, well, how can I how can I best help support that? Or I care deeply about, you know, racial justice and equity uh, or gender equality, but I'm mm -hmm. not going to start organizations to do that. Mm -hmm. But what I do know how to do is help activate young people and support them around causes. And I was like, man, if I can kill these two birds with one stone, actually help support these young people uh, so they can go, you know, pursue better academic careers, professional careers, and apply those skills around any cause they care about to change the world, we can make exponential impact. And so, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I'm not directly involved in like working to combat climate change other than, you know, a little bit of like independent personal advocacy or, or giving and stuff here and there. But I am really working really hard to build and grow a legacy to support young people uh, help them develop these skills they can use throughout so many aspects of life and hopefully apply them around so many causes like, you know, particularly climate change, racial mm -hmm. justice and equity, gender equality and, and more. That is so freaking cool. I absolutely love that. And I'm so grateful that you are able to create that resource because coming from someone, um, you know, where I grew up, you know, in an environment, it was so just like country out in the middle of nowhere. There was no resources for anything beyond a traditional conventional education. Like there, there weren't like, you know, clubs or organizations or I could join or like, you know, groups of, of young people doing things. It, it was, you know, I was completely isolated. And I remember like growing up, like, I, you know, was constantly like starting businesses as I was younger and then I was volunteering for nonprofits and I wanted to start my own nonprofit organization and, and all this stuff. And I was, I had to do it just completely alone via, you know, like Google search and like learning everything on my own and had no resources or anything to connect with. Um, and I had so, I feel like I had so much untapped potential that, you know, thankfully I was, you know, able to d develop and understand more over time. But had I had that resource, you know, when I was in those really formative and really, you know, like driven years as like a high schooler, um, that would have made such a big difference in my life. And I think particularly what you're talking about in the communities that are typically, overlooked or ignored, um, you know, uh, kids and teenagers who are, you know, minorities and uh, who have such valuable life experiences and such drive, um, really instilling those resources and opportunities in them from a young age will help create a future generation of leaders that will hopefully be a lot better than the leaders we have now. I'm just going to say that, <laughs> like, uh, that it will really help make the world a better place because even more so you have the, I feel like you have the right perspective, even more so than a one-off organization, a one-off charity, uh, creating, 
you know, uh, not creating, but you helping to really empower entire, you know, an entire group of future leaders um, in the next generation is such a long-term and sustainable way to make an impact far beyond what you could even individually do as a person. I, I think it's awesome. And like, also like where can people find that, you know, the resources in the website um, in case anyone who's watching who is young and wants to make a difference um, can use? Yeah. Yeah, the, our Legacies programs are free. We don't charge schools or students for them. So you can just check out LegacyYouthLeadership.org. Uh, there's programs running all the time, and we'd love to work with you. Yeah, make sure you guys go check it out because it's, it's super, super cool. Um, and also kind of like as a final final question, um, because there's so much conversation, you know, like about the global water crisis and so many solutions that you guys are providing and everything. But um, as with pretty much any issue that faces the world, so much of it comes down to like what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to make a difference, what we collectively can do together. So I'd love to hear from you, like, what do you think is the most impactful way that we just normal people on a, you know, everyday life can do to, um, you know, help end the global water crisis? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, right? I'm, most people, I think, hate uh, being told like, oh, here's where you can donate. But the reality is like mm -hmm. this particular issue, it's kind of a, a numbers game. Like we know mm -hmm. how to solve it. Or we're not like hoping we find a cure. Uh, 25 bucks one time gives someone safe water for life. Uh, you know, so it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, but if you're like, Hey, I, you know, I don't have $25 or, uh, you know, my community can't do that. There's so many things you can do from using your voice to raise awareness, uh, bringing us to your school to educate your community about it and see how you can organize friends to get involved. Uh, there's a ton of things we could do. So I, I would say like, you know, check out thirstproject.org. Um, and there's tons of resources. We'd love to connect with you around. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. And if you are someone, because I know, you know, not everyone has the financial freedom to be able to, you know, like make donations. Um, what you touched on, talking about the global water crisis, um, posting about it, sharing about it is so important because I would venture to guess like, and in my experience, the majority of people that I've talked to this about aren't even aware that there is a crisis, that there still is that many people who don't have access to clean drinking water around the world and all the other issues that affects like women's rights, education, et cetera, et cetera. So even you just like talking about it, posting about it, raising awareness, having conversations with your family members, you know, um, with your friends, um, even that alone, if, you know, uh, you, uh, donations aren't a possibility, um, I feel like that can be so impactful as well, if, if you agree, I assume you do. <laughs> 100%. Oh my gosh, absolutely. It literally, it takes everybody. I mean, that's the first thing we ever did was go talk to people yeah. on Hollywood Boulevard and see who we met and see where it led. And, you know, two schools became, became 10 schools and now 800 schools. So, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's literally how you started it. it, it having those conversations is so important. And I mean, I love being able to talk to you because it's... It's a breath of fresh air in the world of nonprofits and organizations and social work where so much of it tends to be very kind of depressing and very, you know, hard to take in and very like, you know, the sad stories, all this kind of stuff. Every time I talk to you, it's always a, a knowledge and an assurance that we are going to end the global water crisis. It's going to happen. It's, it's possible. We're already headed there. And it's so cool that you're, you know, championing that. So thank you so much for like the work that you're doing. I'm so glad like we've been able to partner. If you guys aren't aware of the partnership that we have, um, Selfless by Hiram has partnered with Thirst Project where when you buy a water impact product, uh, one person is provided with clean drinking water for 50 years. Um, and so if you are someone who, you know, wants to take care of your skin while also simultaneously, um, you know, making an impact on the world and helping end the global water crisis. Definitely check out the products. I'm so glad that we've been able to partner together. It's been like such a beautiful relationship and I'm so glad that I'm able to hopefully help spread the message of, you know, what you guys are doing and, and the, the water crisis. And I'm, I'm really glad we've been able to work together. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, everything you say is so eloquent and I really look up to you a lot. So I, I really appreciate you coming on and where can people, you know, um, find you or, you know, your organizations on social media? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can check out Thirst Project at, at Thirst Project or Legacy Youth Leadership at, at Legacy Youth Leadership. Uh, and then I'm just Seth Maxwell One.
But I mean, to echo what you said, like we are so grateful. Like, thank you for uh, believing in the work that we're doing with young people and, and the work around the water crisis and being so incredibly generous and supportive. And uh, you've made, I mean, truly life changing impact in so many communities. So uh, thank you. Of course, of course. Hey, it's everyone who's watching and supporting Selfless by Hiram and using the products. That's everyone who's been making the impact. So thank you guys, uh, anyone who has been a part of that. And if you guys haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Just Position YouTube channel so you can see the videos and make sure you check us out wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, thank you again, Seth, for coming on. Make sure you check out our other episodes um, because we've had a ton of really interesting conversations. They're all on the YouTube channel or, you know, wherever wherever you do stream the episodes. This has been a presentation of Cadence 13, an Odyssey studio. New episodes out every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And we will see you guys in the next episode. Mwah.